Today we're talking about uh, John chapter 8, verse 51. Now, it'll be in context. If you don't have your sermon guide, would you please walk out to the lobby and find one? It might help you a little bit. We're going to take science and the Bible and John 8, 51, and we're going to bring it together. Now, some of you are going to think I'm crazy. Some of you are going to say, yay, finally, somebody is saying God is more powerful than science. Uh, a lot of talk is going on about the pandemic. Uh, I have no desire to go there, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I want to teach the Bible. That's my primary task, and I'll do the best I can. i got a pile of rocks up here. I, I trust you will uh, discover that in a few moments. So on your sermon guide, number one, write if you would, 354 years ago, 1666, a young man around the age of 23, 24, Sir Isaac Newton, discovered what then scientists began to call the law of motion. And the law of motion is just simply every action has a reaction. And those of you that know science, every action has an equal, an opposite reaction. So what I want you to understand is action, reaction this morning. Think about it. Action, reaction. Cause and effect. Every action, there is an equal reaction. That's what science says. So if you say something, if you do something, there's a good chance there's going to be a reaction. Like I said, a 23-year-old discovered this just simply by tossing a ball, by walking around life, by watching things fall. He just discovered it and he began to put it in motion. So if I was to take the ball and I was to just simply throw it, <laughs> some of you might react. That was a soft one. <laughs> this is even softer. This softball has got some weight to it, but what if I was to pick up a rock? Would that get a reaction? So stay, stay with me. Uh, we're looking at the text. When Jesus said what he's about to say 2,000 years ago, there was a massive explosion. 2,000 years ago, and even to this day, when Jesus talks, things explode around his word. So John chapter 8 verse 51. You got it? John chapter 8 verse 51. It says this. Jesus is talking to Jewish people, religious people. It's probably the last day of the Feast of the Booths. Uh, the Feast of the Booths is that time, that holiday where they would celebrate the great uh, exodus from Egypt out of slavery, out of bondage. Jesus rescued them. And the the booths were temporary housing as they wandered in the wilderness. The people had to live somewhere. It was a tough life, but Jesus was still saving them. So Jesus has been interacting with the Jewish leaders and Jewish people, teaching the word of God. And he says here in 851, the powerful words, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. So my word is the action, the words of Jesus. And there's a reaction. You got to decide who you're going to believe. What word are you going to keep? And then there is a result. If you keep Jesus' words, if you believe, if you abide, if you trust, notice it says never see death. This set up a massive explosion 2,000 years ago. Keep my word is this concept of to continue. It is to abide. Never see death is basically you have everlasting life. It, it's not that you won't end up dying and in the grave. That's everybody understands from the book of John that he's saying you will never, your body will never die. What he's saying is you will live eternally. Death becomes a door into literally life everlasting. So I'm saying to you, Jesus is calm. 
he steps into the crowd and he says in John 8, 51, look at it again, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, word is logos, my truth, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word logos, and the word logos was with God, and the word was God, logos, same word. If you keep my word, he said, you will never see death. Now, I want to suggest to you that what you do above the word truly, truly, which is probably something that sounds old-fashioned to us, write really, really. That's what it's saying. Or if you like something scientific, write fact, fact. It's amazing. The goal of science is to discover facts. That's the goal of science. Here, Jesus is announcing truth. He's not discovering it. He's delivering it. Jesus only speaks facts. And every one of us, 2,000 years later, we have to decide which, quote, facts are we going to follow. See, truth, truth, fact, fact. Jesus did not use science to validate his facts. Make sure you understand, he's God. The idol cannot be science. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Jesus is simply saying, I control life. He's saying, I control death. I promise eternal life if you believe. That's an amazing statement. You say, Roger, where is this coming from, John 3.16? How many of you have memorized John 3.16? Raise your hand. Okay. How about John 5.24? Write that one down. And John 6.40? and John 6, 47, and John 6, 51. Friends, this language, if you keep my word, if you trust, if you abide, if you believe, just if you, it's all over Scripture. Every action creates a reaction, and modern-day science would see this today, and they would say, no way. Same thing 2,000 years ago. No way. So here's the context. Look at verse 48, John 8, 48. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly, you are a Samaritan, and you have a demon? I would submit to you, circle the word Samaritan and demon, because this is nothing more than name-calling. This is shaming. Some people would like to say this is an early form of science. Some people advocate this as psychology early, Psychiatry, sociology, demonology, religious people 2,000 years ago starting to use science. But friends, you know that science says if you can't prove it, it doesn't work. You have to test it, you have to duplicate it in a lab, you have to show be beyond a reasonable doubt, or you're called a liar. So what's going on in this verse here clearly is the shaming is, this is crazy talk, Jesus. And ladies and gentlemen, when you start to doubt God, when you start to doubt the Bible, when you start to have doubts, you have slipped into the same mindset of these Jewish people. Crazy talk. You're saying Jesus is a Samaritan. Religious people 2,000 years ago used slurs. And that word Samaritan is literally a bigoted term. If you went all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 7, you understand that the history of the Jewish people, God-fearing Jews were forbidden, anathema, forbidden to marry non-Jews. So Samaritan is a term, it's a slur against a Jew who married a non-Jew. Samaritans were viewed in Jesus', Jesus day as unholy, as evil. So Samaritans, now stay with me, listen to this. Here's the subtlety of crazy talk or slurs or when someone starts to talk about demonology, watch this. Here's, here's the subtlety. Jesus, who's your earthly daddy? You see, they heard that Jesus talked about his heavenly father. See, Jesus, your mama, did your mama have a husband when you were conceived? You see, friends, going on deep behind this is some very crafty spinning it. 
If you just take it at face value, Samaritan, they're just outright saying that he's just simply totally rejected. I'm submitting to you, number three, why does the Bible never validate itself by science? Why? Wrestle with it. And I love science. Why does the Bible never refer to Jesus as a scientist? Let me give you a multiple choice. Three questions. Why does the Bible never validate itself as science? Or validate itself by science? Multiple choice. A, because science did not exist 2,000 years ago. How many of you have walked through the Hezekiah's tunnel? Some of you have. How many of you have been to the pyramids? How many of you have studied Noah's Ark? How many of you have heard of the Temple Mount? Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't take long before you see science has always been at work. It's just that today we probably quantify it, qualify it, we can put it in a book, and, but science has always been active. Friends, science did exist 2,000 years ago. History shows lots of science and lots of math for thousands of years. So that's not the right answer. How about the Bible is not trustworthy? The book that you have is not trustworthy. That's why the Bible never validates itself by science. Now, that's not the answer. I can say that because today, by all accounts, archaeologists and historians use the Bible to validate their today's discoveries. They do a dig, they find something, they go to the Bible to learn more about what they found. It's crazy. The most reliable and tested book in history is the book that you hold in your lap or in your phone. It's an amazing thing. See, C, the answer is Jesus created all science. Jesus created all things, including all the laws of science. But we get caught up just omitting Jesus. And you can't do that. That's not honoring to Jesus Christ. God made science. Jesus is God. Jesus created all things. You say, Roger, where do you get that? Well, look up here on the screen. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. Guess what? That word is logos. It's the same one in 851. And the word logos was with God, and the word logos was God. You see, the Jesus that the, they're saying, you're a Samaritan and you got a demon, that's God. Here's Colossians 1.16. For by him, logos, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Jesus, the Word, Logos, God, and for Him. So Jesus is the life giver. He's the life creator. He's the life sustainer. He is everything. Science has chosen to simply say Jesus is a Samaritan. Jesus has demons. He's crazy. But the Bible says all things were created by and through and for Jesus. And you have to wrestle every day, just as I have to wrestle with, do I believe this word? Look at John 8, 48. The Jews answered and said to Jesus, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? Look at 49. And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. John 8, 49. I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. May I submit to you number four? Jesus never answers to science, only his heavenly Father. And can I challenge every one of us here today? That's who you need to answer to. You need to answer to God. I need to answer to God. He honors his heavenly Father. He does not check with science to see if his word is right. He says, you will never die. You keep my word, you will never die. It's a most amazing, turn it upside down in this modern day that we live in, everything has to be tested and approved by science. Science is not God, people. I embrace it. Often you'll see me wearing a mask. I'm not foolish. I value going to the doctor for my physical. 
I encourage my wife to do the same. There's lots of good things we can learn from science. But never will science say, keep the word of Jesus and you will never see death. Never say that. Because they can't prove that. 49 says, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Look at verse 50. But I do not seek my glory. There's no self-serving in Jesus. Is a Complete humility. Jesus comes by the highest authority to recognize God the Father. I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps, there it is, my word, he will never see death. Full authority Jesus has over death and life. That word keep there, it means things like believe. Faith, abide, follow, continue, repent, confess. It, there, is an, there is an idea that you believe in Jesus and then you go live like the devil. If you believe in Jesus, you're going to live like Jesus. If you think you can believe in Jesus and then go live like the devil and you're going to end up in heaven, you're mistaken. Because that's not what Jesus says. Listen, saving faith, true faith, results in abiding in Jesus, keeping his word. Not perfection, nobody gets there. But you will recognize, I love Jesus, I, I messed it up, I confess, I repent, and you get back following Jesus. It's none of this just simply walk away and forget it. John 8.52 says, the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, the prophets also, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. What happened to Abraham? Friends, this is crazy talk. That's what they're trying to push on Jesus. Demon possession. Look at the reaction, verse 53. You are not greater than our father Abraham who died. Prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? False prophet, in other words. You're a liar. You say you have power over life and death? 54, Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Verse 55, And you have not come to know God the Father. My insertion. You have not come to know God the Father. And there are Christians here today, in quote, who have not come to know God the Father in this particular context. There are Christians here today, perhaps, who say they follow Jesus, but they really don't know Jesus. Jesus says, you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know God the Father and keep his, watch this, logos, word. 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, Jesus says. Think about that word. Think about that verse. And he saw it and was glad. Abraham's not dead. This would have blown him out the water right there. He's alive. Scientists would take this verse and say this is crazy talk. Abraham saw Jesus. He died a long time ago. And Abraham's glad. Abraham is living today and saw Jesus today? It's crazy talk. 57. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. By the way, Jesus is probably maybe 30 to 31, 32, 33, 34, somewhere in there. And have you seen Abraham? Now, here is just the phenomenal statement of divinity. Verse 58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, fact, fact, really, really, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Friends, this is an, the ultimate of ultimate statements. This is self-existence. I'm God. 59, therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So these stones represent rejection. There's an action and a reaction to Jesus' words. Number five, 
anything, even rocks, to censor Jesus for the words, I am. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. In other words, keep the words of Jesus and you will get rocked. If you start talking about Jesus in today's culture, they, you'll get a pushback. You'll be censored. Jesus is saying, before Abraham, I was. I am. There's no beginning, no ending. Visible and invisible is created by Jesus. Life giver, ruler, sustainer, everyone is going to submit to Jesus sooner or later. All right, application. Number one, this is a reaction to Jesus' words. Number one, Jesus lovingly sacrifices and gives love promises. This is the most amazing thing. Here's the God of the universe steps down in our time system and says, God loves you. Oh, and you're evil. God loves you, and you call me a demon. God loves you, and you call me a Samaritan. God loves you. I'll die on the cross for you. You see, Jesus steps into our world, and he says, believe me, be born again, and you will never die. And he does this by miracles. He turns water into wine. He heals children. He heals the blind, the crippled. He feeds 5,000. He walks on water, trying to convince me that he's God. He crosses into the forbidden zone in Israel. He walks up to a woman that nobody would ever touch, a good Jewish person. And he advocates that this woman can have eternal life, John 4. Before Abraham was born, I am. And he says, come on, Roger, believe. All of this that I do for you, believe, abide, repent, confess. Jesus lovingly sacrifices and gives love promises. It's the most amazing, amazing thing. Number two, with miracles, Jesus loves evil people. And some people truly believe, keep, and some people hate, reject. Where are you? You may have heard this story. Not too long ago, a worship leader in America who led worship in a very popular church recanted. He went from believing Jesus to saying, I no longer believe in Jesus. So he did that for a couple of months. And then he said this. He said, I thought I would be able to say, great, I'm done with God. I can just live my life free of that stuff now. But what I discovered was, as soon as I quit Jesus, I had freedom. But then very quickly, I was like, okay, so what do you believe? And for the last two months, it's been a crash course in figuring out what I believe. I no longer call myself a Christian, and I'm not an atheist. Let's think about that one. Naturalism is ultimately dissatisfying. After rejecting Jesus, I now have a hard time saying I don't believe in God because I'm sort of like, well, maybe. Since rejecting Christianity, I've never had more conversations about God than I'm having right now. I've never read the Bible more than I am right now. Well, what if he would have read the Bible a whole lot before? He goes on to say, intelligent design argument for God's existence is very compelling. When my son was born, I don't see how, in, how, how anyone, someone could have had a child and not believe in God. I have days where I'm like, maybe I do believe in God. And then I have days like where, no, I don't think I do. It's really, really strange. You have to choose. You have to choose. You have to keep. You have to believe. Please do not hear me say that you lose your justification. Those of you that understand theology, justification, sanctification, right? What's the last one? Glorification. If you're truly justified, you're eternally secure. But that true justification will show up in sanctification and you will abide, continue, keep, repent, confess. 
And all that's going to lead to glorification. Number three, to those who keep, abide, continue to believe the words of Jesus, you enjoy eternal life. It's amazing. John 8, 51, true faith leads to keeping. Sincere salvation leads to abiding in the words of Jesus. There is a cause and effect, an action and a reaction. There are self-identified Christians, I hope none of them are here today, but maybe. In America today, there are self-identified Christians. Here's what they believe. Recent uh, Arizona Christian University uh, came out with this high-quality uh, research. 43% of the self-identified Christians, 43% maintain that when Jesus was on earth, Jesus sinned. Think about it. Just study one book in the Bible, the book of John. Jesus even declares he didn't sin. And the Pharisees could not really pin any sin on him. 48% believe, self-identified Christians, 48% believe a person who is good enough or does enough good works can earn salvation. If you haven't heard that this from me before, let me just say it again. For by grace you've been saved by faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You cannot earn your way to heaven. It's by grace. It's by grace. It's by the mercy. It's by the work of Jesus. Justification is when you sincerely believe that Jesus died on the cross, resurrected for you, died for you, he took the punishment, you get forgiven, and he says, you're born again. And you start down this path of learning how to continue, how to abide. And it's some days you mess it up, and some days you follow, and you repent. You can't earn it. You're never good enough. For all have sinned. Never going to get good enough. 44% of self-identified Christians in America do not believe that history is the unfolding narrative of God's reality. In other words, God does not engage in my life. Why pray? God's not connected. Mankind, God's not there. 44%. That's almost like, what, half? 43% do not believe there is a common, God-given purpose to humanity. 43% do not believe there is a common, God-given purpose to humanity, like to know God, like to abide, like to follow, like to love, like to serve Him. 42% seek moral guidance primarily from sources other than the Bible. 43, 42%. How about this one? 42% do not identify and confess their sins on a daily basis. 42%. 40% do not believe that human life is sacred. 40% do not believe that human life is sacred. 44% claim the Bible is ambiguous in its teaching about abortion. 44% claim the Bible is ambiguous in its teaching about abortion. Are you reading the Bible? Are you studying it? Read it. 34% argue that abortion is morally acceptable. 34% argue that abortion is morally acceptable if it spares the mother from discomfort. Hardship, financial, or emotional loss. 34% argue that abortion is morally acceptable if it spares the mother from discomfort. Hardship. 
financial or emotional loss. 40% say lying is acceptable if it advances personal interests or protects your reputation. 40%, four out of 10. 36% say they fail to seek and pursue God's will for their life each day. 36%. 34% say they reject the idea of legitimate marriage as one man and one woman. 34% self-identified Christians say they reject the idea of legitimate marriage as one man and one woman. Have you studied the words of Jesus lately? Jesus says it's man and wife, husband and wife. 32% say they do not say thank you to God each day. So when Jesus said, Roger, keep my word, abide my word, he's talking about get behind me. He's not saying get behind the devil. So number four application, Jesus' actions resulted in crucifixion. They picked up the rocks, they were ready to take him out right there, and they chased him. And number five, keep or reject? That's the question for you and me. Jesus steps in, he gives us the truth, and he says, Roger, your call. Will you believe, will you abide, will you continue, will you repent, will you confess, or will you pick up the rocks? It's the most profound action the world has ever known. God sends his son into our world to say, I love you, and I know you're going to rock me. You're going to crucify me but I'm going to go all the way to the cross because some of you are going to believe and some of you are not. This is the most profound love I've ever seen. Just amazing. Bow your heads, please. God, may Jesus um, be honored. May we be careful how we value science. May we be careful how we value you. God, I say thank you for amazing love, an amazing promise. If you'll keep my word, everlasting life, I say thanks. And God, thank you for many of the individuals earlier in the service who had the willingness to say, I love Jesus. God, I would ask that I would be willing to do that in my neighborhood, that I would be willing to do that wherever I go, and I'd ask the same for everyone here today, that we would recognize your son is God, and that we would be unashamed and we would be keeping, abiding, not throwing rocks. God, give us that ability, each one of us, to follow. And God, thank you for mercy when I don't follow. Thank you for the spirit that convicts me, the willingness to repent and to get back behind you. We give you the praise. All God's people said,